Welcome to this week's Rider Support. This week we're going to talk about altitudes, how much and when you should introduce intensity into your training regime. But first we're going to talk about how to stay safe on the roads and tips for urban cycling. Sarah, let's get straight into it. Okay, question number one. I love cycling in the city, but let's be honest, it sometimes feels like I'm in an action movie, dodging cars, potholes and pedestrians with a debt wish. Anthony, give me some practical tips to stay safe out there on the roads. How do I survive traffic, tricky intersections and drivers who act like they've never seen a bike before? And that's from Matthew H. I think this is a really good question and we're seeing so many new people coming into cycling and so many of them are coming in and they're prioritizing stuff like buying kits, like trying to get fit, which is all wordy pursuits. But a big glaring hole, I think, is road safety and particularly how to ride around cars. Depending on where you live, I've grown up my entire life, long before I was any sort of cyclist who had an eye on training. I was riding through the city centre with my dad where he'd bring me into work and he'd say, like, don't lose my wheel through the traffic and you'd learn how to navigate the traffic. And I think as you spend enough time riding in the city, you start to see that every city is basically the same. Like whether I've been riding in Chicago, New York, Toronto, the cities are kind of the same and you pick up almost the unwritten set of rules. And I don't think I've ever tried to fully articulate this before but hopefully it's just kind of second this. nature yeah you just kind of do it and i know i've been trying to hammer it into you as well we're going through the city of you know do's and don'ts and sometimes there are some of these things i'm going to go through there you know if a driver listens to this they're going to be like oh that's blatantly ignorant but all of this has an overriding principle and the overriding principle isn't the traffic laws it's not you know to please drivers it's to get home safe so they're all designed to get home safe and i think that should be your primary goal to get home safe every single time i was actually talking to a friend i cycled to meet a couple of friends a couple of weeks ago on the brompton and it's about a 25 minute cycle and one of the girls was like i'd love to start cycling i'd love to start commuting but i'm actually afraid and it really is pretty terrifying yeah it didn't really dawn on me that people were too afraid to cycle just because i spend most of my life on a bike and i feel quite comfortable cycling in and out of the city as well but yeah be interested to hear kind of what your your tips are I think some right so I'll go through some of the most important ones for me and I think there's actually a good conversation if anyone wants to take it in the comments below and add stuff to this or I'm sure I'll get some criticism for some of these scanning the road makes a much bigger difference in an urban environment than it does out in the country so I'm always scanning the road for tram tracks All, most of these things are born from experience like I've earned or learned these like <laughs> I've crashed on tram tracks on front of an entire busy tram station and come down and cut myself to pieces Tram tracks are super slippy, but also coming into corners, you're going to have wet leaves, slippery surfaces like road markings, paint, shores. So I'm constantly scanning the road. The next one, I think, is a defensive road position. Cycling tracks, at least in Ireland and the UK, they're normally positioned on the far left of the road. You're obviously going to flip this if you're in the US. They're on the far left of the road, and there's normally a left turning lane to your right. So for me, it makes more sense to come and occupy a defensive road position if I'm coming to a junction like that. So I'll move across and occupy the entire lane. And to run with that defensive road position, if I'm in a lane of traffic where I don't think a car can pass me at a suitable distance, like, you know, the the safe passing distance of 1.5 meters, I wouldn't always adhere to that. I feel safe enough when getting passed by you know, two feet, but if a car is going to try and squeeze past, I'm going to totally remove that choice for him. Yeah. So if he thinks he's going to squeeze, squeeze past and give me two centimeters to spare, it's not happening. I'm moving out into the center of the lane and I'm going to just take that rat. I'm going to have, you know, probably my headphones on or one of them on at least. And I'm going to drown out the beeping from behind, hopefully, because you're making much slower progress than the cars are. But for me, taking that whole lane is important. Another circumstance where I look to take that whole lane is I don't want to be, I want to leave myself an out always. So if I have a high curb or sidewalk to my left-hand side with shores, potholes near the side of the sidewalk, I'm not riding there. Because if I get squeezed, I'm getting pinched against that. Like I'm not going to be able to generate the up trust to bunny hop that curb, especially if it's a side, a high one. So I'm leaving myself an out always. So again, I'm taking the whole lane there. And it's slowing down traffic and some people will say it's ignorance, but it's all run through that filter of get home safe. It's reducing the risks of me getting hit by a car. 
Uh, sorry, I know this like seems like a long list, but I think there's so many things, and if someone even picks up one of these, mm. I think it's pretty really crucial. Yeah. Something we started both doing in the last few years, it's riding with a rear light. Yeah, yeah. I never go out without my rear light now. It's it's become a habit, and a front light now I ride with too. Yeah, and you could even build on that, which I don't do. I use the Garmin Varia, yeah. which gives you a little bit of an idea when there's cars coming. Uh, door distance away from parked cars so that again could mean you're taking the whole lane so doors aren't a variable size like people are like oh i got doored they look at someone else's fault you need to have as chucko willick could say extreme ownership if you're getting doored if you're getting doored you're riding within dooring distance of a car so move out take the lane if there's parked cars if you absolutely like have to be riding within door distance of a car it's stressful because you need to be scanning every single car to see if there's somebody in that car. You need to be mm. looking in their wing mirrors, looking in their rear view mirror, seeing if you can see around the headrest to see if there's somebody in the car. That for me stresses me out too much. It's too much concentration and it takes my concentration from other stuff. Maybe someone, you know, turning left across me into a car park. I can't view both those things at the same time. So I'll move out door distance away from a car and yeah, again occupy the whole lane. That one for me is, I do find kind of difficult and obviously it makes absolute sense, but I do feel a little bit paranoid taking up, you know, a very mid position in the road to get away from yeah, the hard. parked cars because the roads, particularly in Ireland, are quite, you know, narrow. So you're not giving very much opportunities for cars to pass you. You've got irate people behind you, but it is something that you do need to do. To, to just be confident and do it. Yeah, I think that's the key word, there's confidence. You need yeah. confidence on that and you will get beeped. But everyone has different priorities on the road. Your priority is to get home safe to yeah. your family. Someone else's priority is to get home fast in their car. Mm. So, you know, you got to just prioritise your safety there. Yeah. Another one is at intersections, I will try and make eye contact with the driver. That's a brilliant tip. Like, I do that all the time as well. Like make sure deep, that uncomfortable yeah, eye contact. Yeah, literally look like into you're their checking eyes. Them out. <laughs> Stare into their eyes and make sure that they see you, that they yeah. actually, you know, give you that glance and acknowledge you. That's a really, really good tip that a lot of people don't do. Just uh, eyeball the person. Yeah, look, we could definitely do a podcast on things not to do. We won't get hung up on that, like tapping on the side of cars and stuff. A- another one to do, I think, is avoid lingering next to buses and trucks they've huge blind spots there's videos online where it's like 50 riders in the blind spot of a truck and you look in his rear view mirror or his side mirrors and there's no one there and then it zooms out and there's like 50 riders or 40 riders or something in that so they've huge blind spots i don't linger at all in traffic especially at junctions i'll try and get out ahead and slightly preempt the light turning green so i'm ahead of the traffic in the junction that's like another one i've just done as habit all the time and i think finally and not that this is an exhaustive list please add it more in the comments anticipating what other drivers or road users might do and i use road users quite deliberately there because it could be electric scooters electric bikes pedestrians anticipating what they're going to do and never assume that they're going to act predictably like leaving yourself an out like if you're coming through slow moving traffic and you're passing slow moving traffic on the left hand side and a pedestrian steps out from between cars, do you have an out? Can you swerve left? Because if you can't swerve left, I'm not coming down that inside lane very fast because I'm anticipating that someone is going to step out. So you're constantly hoping, like, there's no point in being morally right. Oh, I was entitled to go fast. Like, morally right and in hospital is not a, you know, a very good place to be. a good situation. So leave yourself an out. Yeah. I think as well, I will add to that is that, We are entitled to be on the road, you know, that cyclists and as you call them road users, we all need to learn how to share the space. We're quite lucky that we have um, for large portions now, very quite recently, um, we have cycle paths. But even if you haven't got a cycle path, you are entitled to be on the road. So please don't feel kind of bullied out of a position if you're not safe. Don't feel intimidated by drivers beeping or shouting at you. It's not nice, but you are allowed on the road. You're legally allowed there and you're legally allowed to look after your own safety as well by doing all of the the tips and tricks that Anthony just gave you. Cycling paths is actually an interesting one as well because it brings up what we were talking about there. Like you don't want to be morally right and in hospital. Cycling paths, everyone's like, oh, I'm on a bike path. I can guard down, be safe. Cycling paths are actually for me probably a little bit more dangerous than the roads because they are very very unpredictable and our guard is generally down a little you've 
like people walking dogs on extendy leads, you have you've kids, kids running. On, yeah, and you've got kids on balance bikes and rollerbladers. Everyone's going at different speeds. So and you'll always get an Amazon driver who decides to just <laughs> park from up. the lane, just park <laughs> right in the middle. of. Like I came along coming through from the city back home the other day. Literally an Amazon Prime delivery truck pulls up, parks, blocked both lanes. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah, you'll just get that. Now, I find that the, the cycle lanes can be a little bit stressful as well. You do need to have... When I was um, medical rep, and the companies used to send us on driving course every uh, every year, basically, it was called defensive driving. And you also, it, it didn't mean... It meant that you were taking care of yourself. And that's essentially what you need to do when you're a cyclist. Kind of we need defensive a defensive cycling cyclist. course. Yes, I agree. Run by Sarah. <laughs> I agree. Okay, I just want to do a little bit of business now and I want to just talk about Whoop. And this podcast is sponsored by Whoop. It's the world's most advanced health and fitness wearable. Whoop is the only wearable that actively coaches you towards your goals and it shows you the impact that certain behaviors and habits have on your health. And right now is a great time to get started with Whoop because they've just kicked off their Sober October Challenge. So why not give your body and mind a little bit of a reset with a one month break from alcohol? Sounds tough, but I can tell you it's not. Last year, Whoop members who spent one month alcohol free experienced loads of improvements to their sleep, resting heart rate, variability and loads more. And I think the thing with that is you don't need to get started with your one month challenge on October 1st. It, It could be October 31st that you get started on your one month challenge. For me, like if anyone's listened to the podcast, I had a wipeout on the mountain bike about five weeks ago, tore my rotator cuff, broke a bunch of ribs and went into a little bit of self-destruct mode where I started out having like a glass of wine at night and then I was like, oh sure, I'm not training tomorrow, I'll have two glasses of wine, I'll have three glasses of wine, I might as well finish the (laughs) bottle. And it's like, what am I doing here? But when the Sober October thing came along, I thought it was an interesting chance to compare data from my whoop in the period where I was feeling sorry for myself in the period alcohol free. And I'm actually shocked at the difference it makes. Even one glass of wine, the difference it makes to my heart rate variability, my restorative sleep. And then anecdotally, if you tie that data to how you feel the next day, it's insane. So if anyone hasn't experimented with this, I think you're drastically going to cut your alcohol consumption all year if you observe this data. Like, Whoop have been good enough to give us a bunch of free months to hand out to listeners of the podcast so they can try this. So the link is going to be in the description below. I highly encourage you to go and try this and try drinking. Great excuse to drink. Try (laughs) drink for a while. Then use your Whoop to observe the effects on heart rate variability, sleep, rest and heart rate when you're drinking and you're not drinking. So if you want to get that free month, it's join.whoop.com forward slash roadman and it's going to be in the description below. Try it and let me know how you get on. Okay, next question. Hey, Roadman Podcast. I've been hearing a lot about altitude tents lately and how they can boost endurance. Can you explain how they work and whether they're worth the investment for someone like me, an amateur cyclist trying to improve my performance? Are there any risks or downsides to using them? I know the pros go to altitude camp, but do you think they also use these tents too? Anthony, have you ever used an altitude tent and would you recommend it? And that's from Carmel. Yeah, I have used an altitude tent. How would I recommend it? So I had an altitude tent from hypoxia, hypoxia, yes. hypoxica, something like that. Yeah. And I had it set up. you never seen this. This was my old apartment before we were going out. I had it set up like in this flimsy frame that they give you with it. And the tent sort of droops all over the place. So one of my friends came down who lived in the apartment above. All right, like, we need to make this a bit more robust. So we got chains from the ceiling up to the corners of the altitude tent but the problem is if someone's coming into your apartment that like doesn't know you and then they see your bedroom with all these hooks and chains and stuff, they're like, what's this weird suffocation sadomasochist dungeon you're bringing me back to? I'm like, no, no, it's fine. I'm just a cyclist. So yeah. You, also sadomasochist. It, it doesn't tell you that on the, on the altitude label when you're doing it. But altitude tents, if anyone doesn't know, the idea is they simulate the effects of being at high altitude. It kind of suffocates you it reduces the amount of oxygen in the air and by reducing the amount of oxygen in the air it forces your body to create more red blood cells red blood cells transport oxygen people doped using epo to create more red blood cells this is a natural way to create epo to create more red blood cells there is genetic responders and non-responders to altitude so both me and you could have the exact same altitude protocol 
I have great results, you have really bad results. I think you don't want to limp into altitude training. It's something that needs to be professionally monitored. You need to be doing blood levels and hitting certain parameters before you get into the tent, monitoring them when you're in the tent, you know, monitoring like what your oxygen saturation levels are when you are in the tent, doing periodic blood tests again to check everything's tracking in the right direction. And then even within that, you have different protocols. Like, are you going to use the altitude just for sleeping high and training low? Mm. Or are you at a place where you're going to also train high and sleep high, where you can come out and jump on a walk bike and put a mask on, stuff like that. Dylan Johnson actually has a good video on contrasting the different protocols on his YouTube channel between sleep high, train low, yada, yada. I think the altitude tents in all honesty aren't worth the money the 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 juice isn't worth the squeeze why like, do you think that because they're so expensive or because i mean they're difficult to to sleep in as well they can't yeah, give you I think that's the main thing so yeah. unless you're looking for tiny marginal gains i think there's easier place to find the gains because right first you have the expense of the altitude that you're going to pay or if you get one second hand maybe three grand if you're buying it new up to six grand so you have the expense of that and then you have the compromise to your sleep so again back to the whoop thing if you're tracking this sleep which you need to be tracking how much are you losing quality of sleep using the altitude tent because if you're losing quality of sleep five percent that probably more than offsets even ambitious targets on what you can expect to gain now having guys on the podcast like olaf boo who's the coach for blumefeld and gustav eden he talked about how they forgo massage they forgo ice therapy they forgo steam room saunas for extra sleep Mm, he's like sleep is the most restorative and regenerative thing you can do when we're in deep sleep we're getting bangs of natural human growth hormone we're recovering in all sorts of documented and undocumented ways so i think that's really my primary consideration is a compromise sleep and then also you have the adaption time you need to spend a lot of time at altitude so eight hours a night on most studies isn't enough So you need to be eight hours a night plus probably two, three hours during the day inside the tent to get those adaptations to it. And you need to do that for prolonged periods of time. So if you're traveling or working, it breaks it up, it resets the clock. So I just think it's not a practical solution for most people and altitude. There's much easier gains. Do you think that um, the pros, obviously, as as Carmel says here, I know the pros go to altitude camp, but you do you think they also use these tents too? Kind of on a when they're not at altitude tents, uh, altitude camps. Do you think they have them at home when they're the world tour guys them? struggle because you know any of the world tour guys I'm talking to either don't use them or live at altitude. Mm. Some of the lifetime Grand Prix lads are using them. Alex Wild, who I had on the podcast, is using them in preparation for altitude events. Acclimation is another benefit to it. If you're racing at Leadville. Yes. Getting ready for an event like that, like a protocol, Dylan Johnson's protocol for getting ready for Leadville is not a protocol that Alex Wilde could use because Alex Wilde has a full-time job. Dylan Johnson spends about five to six weeks gradually booking Airbnbs higher and higher up the mountain to get ready for Leadville. There is a benefit there to it for acclimation, but I think most of the pros don't use it because you need so much time in the tent and they don't get that much time in the tent because of their travel and training schedules. They got to go to training camp. They got to come back. They got to go to classics. They got to come back. They got to get ready for Giro, and they're just not at home enough to get the benefit. Rob, man, I know how serious you take your goal setting, whether they're fitness or life-related goals. If you're looking for a powerful ally to support you on this journey, look no further than Huel. Huel has become my secret weapon for when I don't have time to prepare a balanced meal. It ensures I get the nutrition I need without sacrificing time or taste. Plus, it stops me from reaching for that takeaway menu. I always throw a bottle into my backpack when I'm heading into the city to work, and it stops me eating junk convenience foods, snacking on croissants and bars of chocolate, because I know they don't support my training goals. It's a handy, nutritious meal on the go, and it's got over 22 grams of protein. Huel is perfect for athletes that don't have time to cook or prepare food before a training session. It's convenient, nutritious fuel at your fingertips, ensuring you hit your daily fueling needs for that session. Huel Ready to Drink has 26 essential vitamins and minerals in every single bottle. You're getting a whopping 175 health benefits. Plus, it's made from natural ingredients like tapika, sunflower seed, coconut, and more. The best part, it's the flavors. There's eight crazy, beautiful flavors. Iced coffee is what's in my backpack right at the moment. 
you can get Huel directly to your home. All you got to do is head on over to the Huel website, huel.com forward slash roadman. It's such an interesting topic, isn't it? I'd love to try an altitude tent. <laughs> I just think, just to see, and as you said, do the do everything correct. Have the blood testing. Make sure that it's not affecting you, you know, taking rather than giving. But it's just completely fascinating. And me. actually on that as well, th- those masks to do like, mm. you know, asphyxiation training like they don't work at all like right. there's absolutely no data to show their effect of despite their marketing claims oh wow interesting yeah. okay all right next question i've been following the 80 20 training principle and i'm clear on the 80 percent low intensity part but when it comes to the 20 percent high intensity i'm not sure how to structure it how do i decide what type of intervals or hard efforts to do in that 20 percent should i focus on vo2 max threshold mix things up and how can i tell if i'm getting the balance right for my goals that's a really interesting Amazing. question it's really yeah. topical the 80 20 principle was designed by steven Seiler, professor steven Seiler, brilliant physiologist and academic and i had him on the podcast once already and he was talking about this distribution of training intensity so 80 percent of your training easy and let me just clarify what easy means to ground some terms so people understand the construction of zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, zone six, they're artificial constructions. They're not based in data. They're only, these are his, his words, not mine. They're not based in data. Someone has artificially come along and they're saying, this is zone one, this is zone two, with no real justification for what zone one and zone two is. I think it was maybe Andrew Cogan and Hunter Allen first proposed. It's the first time I've seen it anyway, and they're training and racing with a parameter book. Steven Seiler will advocate and say, there's only really three zones there's your first inflection point, LT1. Then there's the gap between LT1 and your second inflection point, LT2. We look at that as a zone two. And then we'll have north or right, if you're looking at it on a graph, of LT2. Explain what LT stands Lactate for. threshold. So it's your first inflection point if you're doing lactate testing. So he looks at it like a traffic light system. You've green to the left of LT1. You've between LT1 and LT2 is an orange. And red is to the right of LT2. So 80% of your training should be in green zone before LT1. And then how you introduce intensity into your training is orange and red training. So above LT1 or above LT2. Now, he just finished a big study, and I'm going to have him back on the podcast in the following, in the coming weeks to talk about this. He just finished a big study to figure out how we assign intensity to that remaining 20%. And the remaining 20%, he studied three different groups. One group where he'd done a standard periodization. So they started out with a, a tempo block, a threshold block, a VO2, and then a sprint block. Another group that done a reverse periodization. So starting backwards, sprint block, VO2, working down. And a, a third group where they randomly assigned intensities into that. And there was no difference at all between the three groups. Interesting. So really interesting. Mm-hmm. Stephen's a brilliant guy. So that podcast, the last one went down a banger. So I'm sure the next one is yeah, done that as well. Was but I just wish I knew that stuff when I was starting training. Yeah. Like how much training you actually have to do. And that podcast is brilliant because he breaks down what effective minimum dose is. Like how much do you need to be training if you only have eight hours a week for training and you're distributing like an hour each day. It's not a good way to distribute your training, but you're going to have to wait and listen to that podcast to find out why. A few knowledge bombs coming to kind of mix everything up. Okay, next question. Anthony, I'm upgrading my bike and I'm torn between Shimano Di2 and SRAM AXS. As someone who's been riding for a while, I'm looking for performance gains, but I'm not sure which groups out will suit me best. Can you break down the differences in shifting feel, maintenance, and overall ride experience? Also, is one better suited for road racing versus long endurance rides? And that's from O'Callaghan 12. So I have Shimano, you have SRAM. So we've both them, yeah. So I've had experience riding both them, you know, quite recently. They're slightly different but not massively different i would say shimano's electric shift and it's buttery smooth like it it's almost seamless feeling it's very intuitive if you've been riding shimano for a long time you will understand how the gears work there's no real surprises it's the normal way it works it's a near silent operation they've nailed the front mech on it like years ago when used to shift from small ring to big ring there was a almost a 50 50 chance you were dropping your chain this was pre you getting into cycling like you'd be terrified to shift from small ring to big ring over the top of a climb because your chain would drop like that's gone like they use a really amazing motor and the shifting from small ring to big ring 
it's crisp and the, the levers have a very traditional Shimano feel to them as well if you're used to using mechanical yeah. group sets. On I, your I feel hand, like with the with Shimano, they've almost added the sound. So you have an audible, you know, with the electric vehicles, they've had to kind of make them a little bit yeah. noisier because oh, they were speaking they have, up yeah. on people. Because just that little audible sound to make sure that, yes, this has in fact, you know, I have in fact shifted up or, up or down because it's very tiny, isn't it? It's a lovely experience. SRAM have gone to a totally wireless shift. And so it's very clean and minimalistic looking the shifting it feels crisper it feels sharper it's almost more mechanical than the shram one the axs uses shram's etop system mm. which means the left shifter shifts down the block and the right shifter shifts up the block and then if you want to go from big ring to small ring you're pushing both them at the same time this isn't intuitive if you've been coming from years of using mm. shimano but i actually really like it like having now used it for a while i would struggle to go back to shimano i took your gravel bike out uh, a couple of months ago i think mine was in the shop and you hadn't said to me that SRAM is different or, you know, do this instead of this. And was it, maybe it was your road bike, because I it definitely wasn't the one bike. And just trying to figure it out, you know, the double click. But I, I actually really liked it as well. I got used to it quite quickly. And I think it really shines true when you're running a one bike setup, like me on the gravel bike, where you don't have to go from big ring to small ring. So mm. there's no pressing both buttons at the same time. You just have gear up, gear down. It's a really nice way. So I suppose to summarise, if you value precision and smoothness and you're primarily focused on road racing i think shimano is maybe the bet for you especially if you've historically been using shimano yeah. if you want flexibility ease of maintenance and are planning a mix of road and gravel shram is maybe better there's one huge win for me which i would struggle to go back to shimano over shram it's the batteries on shram having gone bike packing and these multi-day events where you have limited access to sometimes charge and stuff if you need to change your battery for SRAM you pop out the battery you stick in a new battery the battery's like tiny you can bring a spare one with you you can bring two spare ones with you you can swap the front mech to the back mech this is all proprietary technology no one else has been able to copy this not Campagnola not Shimano if you want to charge a Shimano you have to get the plug plug it in and have a mains right there. Yeah. Now, this is practically very problematic. So, like, we go stay in places like, a, say, a hotel in Albania. So you go into the hotel, and the guy's like, no, you can't bring your bike up to the room. We have a shed out the back that's secure or locking that you can put it in. So you lock the bikes in there. My Shimano, or my SRAM, is low on battery. I pop out the batteries, I bring them up to my room, and I charge them. My buddy's Shimano is low like he's asking around for extension leads to try and run power into the shed. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So if you're doing bike packing, Badlands type stuff, which Sarah has got a one eye on, which you might talk about next week, <laughs> uh, it's shram for me all day long. Really? Okay. Because uh, so I was, was having a little look. I was having a conversation with this. Somebody DM'd me on uh, Twitter during the week, just basically wondering which would I go for, and. I was basically said exactly what you've been talking about. I was looking it up on the forums. People are so loyal to either SRAM or Shimano and they won't, you know, if you're kind of team Shimano, they are really embedded in it. And, you it, know, it's... That's it's, changed though, I think, isn't it? Because it used to be, no, SRAM didn't have a very culty following. Shimano had it and Campagnola had it. Campagnola, yeah. Actually, it's funny that this uh, rider doesn't uh, even talk about Campagnola at all don't yeah <laughs> hard no okay next question Anthony and Sarah one thing that really bugs me is when people chat in the middle of hard efforts or climbs and then expect everyone to wait for them when they get dropped how do you handle situations like this without causing any tension and what's the best way to keep things fair for everyone in the group Kit I don't know I think this is a short answer I don't have much to say on this one like I don't think there's a correlation between chatting and getting dropped. I just don't. I don't think you're using up like oxygen. I can't chat when I'm in the red, so I don't know how this person can chat if they're in the red. Maybe they're new and they're self-conscious and they want to keep chatting or something. I don't know. But for me, it's just like respecting other people's efforts. I actually think about it the other way. If I'm the strongest in the group and I'm able to chat, like if my efforts are four out of ten and someone else is at an eight or a nine out of ten, I just want to shut up and respect their effort. It's about respecting everyone's suffering. Like I had a friend years ago and he pointed it out to me. I was a lot stronger than he was at the time. He'd just come into cycling and I was riding full time and he was doing a 20 minute test on the on a climb 
and I was chatting to him during the 20 minute test. Oh, you know, go on, keep it going. And it irritated him and it demotivated him that I was still able to talk so freely when he was in the red. I haven't seen the inverse where somebody that's so weak is chatting, 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 chatting on a climb and then gets dropped. But I don't know. So I kind of disagree a little bit because we do have a thing called a talk test. So you'll kind of, let's say I don't have my heart rate monitor on or a parameter. We've been out for runs together and you've said to me, oh, I bet your heart rate is 120 because you're chatting away. And then when my heart rate goes up and I'm kind of getting out of breath, I can't chat. You're like, oh, I'd say your heart rate is about 150. Let's pull it back a little bit. So I do definitely think that um, it does have an effect on, you know, if you're chatting, you're not focusing on the effort. You've said to me a million times when we're climbing something now, you know, stop talking there, Sarah, and just focus on your effort. It's more because it's just hard to listen to someone like out of breath yeah. talking rather than yeah. any I think, to it. I think this, I think Kit's problem is that he feels the person in the group ride is not as strong as the rest of the group. They're using energy by talking on the climb. Yeah, and then the right. group has to be, has to wait at the top of the climb for the person who's expended the energy. Yeah, but that's all based on that assumption that they're using energy talk. And I don't think that's it. Yeah. I think that's false. Yeah. But again, coming from the other side of things, I am in the red so often on our group spin. I I always think that people on our group spin, they don't know me <laughs> sometimes until you get to the coffee shop. I can't talk. They but don't that's know what I'm saying to you, like about respecting the effort. Like, yeah. I think you just like if someone's in the red, respect that they're in the red and you don't totally. need to be talking like you're a four out of 10. Well, I always say if somebody rolls up to me and I am 180 beats per minute, I will just point to my heart rate, my bike computer and be like, I'm completely in the red here. I'm sorry. You won't get any chat from me. I'll chat you at the coffee shop. And that seems to do. Okay. Sorry. Don't really have much advice. We haven't really come across this that much. Okay. Next question. Sarah, I saw your post on HRV on Twitter this week. I've been tracking my HRV for a while now, and I understand the basics of how it correlates with recovery, but I'm curious about the finer details. How should I adjust my training when HRV trends lower for several days, but I don't feel physically fatigued are there specific patterns in hrv data that indicate when it's better to push through versus pull back especially during the build phase and that's from hiroshi I, I, you've done a lot of i'll let you jump in on this one because i know you've done a lot of research in hrv and you've done some solo casts on it mm. for me i'd point them back to the episode i done with dan plews who's one of the pioneers in using hrv and the big takeaway i got from that is Data is a proxy for feelings yeah. and you can't look at data in a vacuum. You need to marry data with how you're feeling. And if it lines up, then brilliant. Then you can start making you know decisions to pull back on your training. But just because you wake up and your HRV is a little low, but you feel great, doesn't mean you should pull back your training. Yeah, totally agree. That's exactly it. I think it's just about looking for trends. So I put this post up on Twitter. My HRV is naturally quite high. So I think on that day, my HRV was 121. And mine really kind of goes between 120 and 135. I think today it's 134 because I had a rest day yesterday. And my HRV tends to be super high the day after I have a nice kind of chilled recovery day. So for me, HRV is a good indication. It's a quite a quick indication as to like looking under the hood. Like we were speaking about earlier, if you've had a drink the night before, a bad sleep, it's kind of a quick at something a quick look at something that's happened not chronically over the course of four or five weeks but something that you've done the previous day or the previous night that will affect that number so resting heart rate is a good indicator of your long term over kind of five six weeks hrv is a really good indicator of something that has affected you positively or negatively in the previous 24 to 48 hours and that's kind of how i look at hrv so you will see a lot of fluctuations so try and focus on the trends rather than single day fluctuations i love focusing on hrv not my resting heart rate but some people will prefer to look at resting heart rate or sleep quality or stress scores but hrv for me is just something that i'm very very interested in so if you're in a build phase a lower hrv is going to be pretty common because you're increasing your training load so that is going to show up in your hrv number but then if it stays low for several days and you're seeing this kind of trend that's a time maybe to take a recovery day and see does that affect your hrv for the following day and i would say that this is why a coach is really really helpful and Anthony coaches me because it's hard to pull back on these days on your own or say okay it's time to take a recovery day or it's time to only 
go for, you know, go to the gym, go for a massage. If you've got a coach in your corner, it's much easier to say, have an open discussion with them about this number and if you should take a couple of days off. The other thing is that your readiness, your readiness to train, a lot of the apps and of course we use Whoop, they will give you a readiness to train based on all of the numbers that feeds into your Whoop device. And some of these will give you a very accurate readiness to train. We've come across situations, Anthony, haven't we, where we've done a really hard day and then the next day it will tell us don't train or do train. But internally you're kind of feeling, well, I actually feel great. I should train today. And that's where you should really start to listen to yourself. We're massive advocates in journaling about our training and about how we feel, our recovery, good days, bad days. And that really should be the number one focus is using your all of this information, HRV, as a tool to kind of give you a little bit of an insight, but really starting to understand how you feel. And I think that Anthony is very good at that naturally because you've always been an athlete. You understand your body. If you're feeling a tiny bit off, it's quite obvious to you. Whereas if I'm feeling off, I just feel, oh, I'll have a coffee or I don't really understand that why that's happening to me. So that is one of the biggest skills that you can that you can really have now is yes, use the devices, but really start to understand yourself. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's brilliant yeah. advice. I think that was a great answer. <laughs> Rob Man, thank you for tuning in to another episode, which I really enjoyed, of Rider Support. There's another one you're going to love up here. Check it out. And we have amazing upcoming interviews, including that one I mentioned with Stephen Seiler. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss those. Talk to you soon.